Good morning, I say again. Uh, we're going to do lesson number nine today. This is the uh, second lesson in uh, the story of the New Testament. We've got quite a lot of reading to do. There's 103 verses. So I would like to get right uh, to it, if you will, because I know there are some of them that I am not going to be able to pass by without commenting on. So this will take a while. The other thing is that in this, uh, all, all of our references today are in the book of, of Acts here. And it's, it says history, one book. Well, the history is, is of the beginning of the church and of what uh, Paul does in the beginning of his missionary journeys and that sort of thing. I also have up here the um, little map that I showed you last week, uh, the New Testament Bible lands. But today we're uh, in the book of Acts. We're all right here. Now, next week when we start uh, reading about Paul, we'll get to some of these other countries up this way. But well, this, this says Judea here. But it's, it's pretty much the whole country of Israel. Uh, Jerusalem is down here. And Nazareth is up here. Caesarea is over here at the seacoast. And Joppa is at the seacoast. And those are the places that are mentioned in, in what we're going to be looking at today. I uh, hope you have your Bibles open to the book of Acts, chapter 1, to start with. And uh, you all know that I like to start with the first verse, but I can't today. I don't like, we don't have time. So uh, we're, our first reading is verses 4 through 8. It says, And being assembled together with them, now, that's talking about Jesus being assembled together with his 11 disciples. He commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which, saith he, ye have heard of me. I, I've told you about this promise of the Father before, is basically what he's saying. He says, John, verse 5, truly baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. When they therefore were come together, they asked of him, saying, Lord, wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? Now, let me tell you, that's what they were expecting him to do, expecting him to be the king of Israel and get rid of Roman rule Roman domination, Roman occupation, if you will. That's what they expected him to do, what, he, what they wanted him to do. They misunderstood his whole mission, which was to establish the kingdom of God, which he did establish. He established the kingdom of God, and he is the king of that kingdom. And as I think I said last week, I like to say that the, that, that, that the kingdom is this high off the ground, that, that it, it's not stopped by rivers or oceans or mountains. It goes right up the side of the mountain, right down into the next valley and so forth. The kingdom of God is everywhere that you go. You cannot go anywhere without finding the Spirit of God there. And he established that at that time. And so the kingdom of God is already in place. It's not something we have to wait for to be um, raptured or taken away or wh whatever it is that's going to happen. 
and we're not really sure what it is that's going to happen. Uh, some, of course, uh, are, are very, um, uh, shall I say, adamant about r being raptured to heaven uh, uh, as though we're going to heaven and we're going to be there forever and ever and ever and ever. And then, of course, there are some that think, well, they're going to stay up there for seven years. Well, there's no time in heaven. There's only time in earth. Uh, heaven is, I don't, know, I don't know where all it is. I can't see it. But I know it's out there. And, and in the daytime, it's, it's up. But in the nighttime, when the sun's on the other side of the earth and we're down, uh, down below, heaven's down there. We're standing in the dark, pointing. We can point up, but we're really pointing down. You know, all these things are mysterious and, and kind of a, a whole bunch of wonderment. But anyway, these 11 fellows, when they were gathered together with him there, here in the first uh, chapter of the book of Acts, are saying, Lord, are you going to establish the kingdom of Israel again? And... and and no, the answer is no, but he didn't give them a direct answer, no. He just says, uh, uh, verse 7, and he said to them, It is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father hath put in his own power, but ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. Now see, Jesus wants to talk about the Holy Ghost. That's what he was talking about in verses 4 and 5. And in verse 6, the 11, some spokesman for that 11, uh, wanted to talk about establishing the kingdom on earth. You know, I don't know if this is ever, uh, if you've ever been in a situation like this, but I've been in situations where I've been in a room with a couple of people talking, and they're having a conversation. I'm sitting over here listening, and I can tell they don't know what either one of them's talking about. One of them's talking about one thing, and the other one's talking about another, and it, it seems like they're having a conversation, but but their comprehension is is different and that's what was going on uh, here among the 11 disciples and Jesus Jesus wanted to talk about the Holy Ghost and the 11 disciples wanted to talk about the kingdom being established on earth so verse 7 let me read that again he said unto them look uh, uh, listen it's not not for you to know the times or the seasons which the father hath put in his own power but ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. Now, I, I, I have uh, in times past, more than, more than once, I've talked about uh, this particular verse as it relates to Pentecostalism, Pentecostal uh, uh, doctrine, and so forth, that uh, typically, the Pentecostals believe that that uh, speaking in other tongues uh, is uh, the initial evidence that you've received the Holy Ghost. Well, that's not what that's not what Jesus said in Acts chapter eight. I'm sorry, chapter one, verse eight. I made a misstatement, but I caught it there. He said, "Yeah, I'm getting, I'm getting better." Yeah. But ye shall receive power. That's how you're going to know that you have all this. When you have boldness, when you have the gumption, when you have the ability to stand in the face of the enemy and rebuke. And I've told you stories about that sort of thing before, personal experiences that I had. When I was just, a, I was just, uh, I think I was 22 years old, 
I had my first real job after graduating from the university and, and went to lunch with, uh, and I'm not going to go give you all the details here, not, not enough time, but with the regional vice president, just he and I, uh, it wasn't an appointment, it was just, it just happened that, 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 it had, that it occurred that day. And this man, on, on our way back from lunch to the office, we were stopped at a red light waiting downtown Oklahoma City, waiting for the red light to change green so we could walk across the street. And somehow he was talking about religion and he said he thought religion was for the weak, that they used it as a crutch. And I said, well, I never really looked at it that way. Uh, I look at it the other way. Uh, it takes a really strong fella to stand up for Jesus of Nazareth in the face of opposition. Uh, I mean, he didn't say much. Uh, I mean, after that, we, the light turned green, we walked on, we went on to the office and went about our business. But I, I did that. Um, uh, I disagreed with a fellow that certainly had control over my destiny in that company. I was young and, and newly hired and a trainee, basically, and this guy was um, a regional vice president. He was actually, I had, there were three supervisors between me and him. And so he could have uh, he could have done whatever he wanted to do with me, but anyway, I'm telling you that that's that's the kind of power that and, and there's more kinds of power too, and we'll see that as we read on here, but it it it, it will give you the gumption, the guts, to speak up for Jesus of Nazareth when you're among a bunch of unbelievers. That's what the Holy Ghost is. Let me read it again, start, start again, verse eight. But ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. So he left these 11 fellows because shortly after this conversation he ascended back to heaven and, and he's been wherever that is ever since then. And he left these 11 guys with this instruction and by association uh, the same thing applies to us. Now, there are some that are called to go to the uttermost part of the earth. We call them missionaries, or we call them evangelists. They travel and they go places and do that. But there is a lar much larger majority of Christian people who, who stay at home. And then they have the same instruction of Jesus. Uh, uh, in, in this little map that I showed you over here a while ago, he said in Jerusalem, which is right there, and in Judea, and in all of the parts of the earth, uh, which this is what the, what, uh, uh, the lands, this map is of the lands that are mentioned. They're actually a little further than that because off over here, a little further from, from this place, you get over to Italy that comes down in the Mediterranean Sea. <clears throat> and Paul goes to Rome, which at that time was the capital of the world. Okay, So the point is that uh, even at home, when you go 
uh, from your neighborhood. First, you do it in your house. And then you do it in your neighborhood. And then you do it when you go to work or school or wherever that is. It's by association, these same sorts of things. And it's just it's saying, uh, no matter where you go, and that means on vacation or wherever you take him with you, you can't get away from it. You, you get, you go downtown into a skyscraping building, you get on the elevator, somebody else gets on the elevator, you talk to them about Jesus. Most of the most time the elevator's just quiet. They just, people just stand there on the elevator saying nothing. Well, don't get on the elevator with me if you're going to do that because I'm going to start some kind of conversation. And you can act like a fence post or a telephone pole if you want to, but I'm going to start some kind of conversation. Uh, and, and my conversation is different than the one you see on the uh, Liberty Mutual Insurance. Uh, there's a commercial with a guy that's uh, got fuzzy hair and got earphones on. He can't hear what the guy behind him is saying. And the guy behind him is trying to sell him insurance. You see this commercial? You familiar with what I'm talking about? Okay, well, uh, I, I somehow or another, if I have, depending on the number of, of floors we go up, we'll have some conversation about how good Jesus has been to me, how good God is, that sort of thing, just to start a uh, conversation. And, and you know my sayings. I mean, the, the kinds of things like uh, people will say, how are you doing? Uh, how are you? Uh, well, I'm better than I deserve. Uh, I, I don't even want what I deserve. Jesus took on him all of what I deserve, and I don't want to take that because he took it. So I don't want to be punished for what he got punished for for my sins. Anyway, I've taken uh, a long time there on those five verses. Um, let's go to chapter 2 and read the first four verses. Still in the book of Acts. It says, And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind. And it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as of fire. And it sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now, in this case, what, 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 what happened is that they were speaking in real languages. Okay? Yeah. Uh, Pentecostal dogma or doctrine or teachings or whatever is that... Um, that when you get the Holy Ghost, you speak in unknown tongues. They, they, and they've gotten to where they call that, and I don't know where this started, I don't know, they call it a prayer language, that's your prayer language. Well, there's no place in the scripture that indicates that when you get the Holy Ghost, you get a prayer language. That, 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 I, I, I don't know who decided to call it that, but uh, right now, you see, I'm having I, I, the boldness or whatever to say, look, it doesn't say that it anywhere. It's just praying in the Holy Ghost, which could right. be construed that way, but not necessarily. Okay, well, you can construe it however you want to, but it doesn't call it a prayer language. Right, that's and, what I'm saying. It, but, it, but it says praying in the Holy Ghost, so somebody could interpret it that way. Praying in the Holy Ghost is... Um, Virtually any prayer that you offer, uh, the, the, you're talking to the Spirit. 
You're, you're talking to something you cannot see, you cannot touch, you cannot... I'm saying that's the verse they used to do that. Yeah, and that's okay. It's okay for you to say that. I'm, I'm just uh, commenting on what these few verses are, uh, verses 1 through 4 in chapter 2, uh, that, that they began to speak with other tongues. And, and we don't have it in our reading today, but I've read it. Uh, many times in the past, if you go look, go look at number uh, verse number nine, um, and and down through um, uh, through eleven, is the list of, of of places where there were people down on the street that heard these conversations going on in their own language. And what they heard was the wonderful works of God. If, if you look right at the end of verse 11, and this again, this is not in our reading, but they were, it said, speak in our tongues the wonderful works of God. So these, uh, now I'm gonna be uh, probably unpolitically correct here, but, <laughs> These ignorant, uneducated Galileans who were in the upper room, who had no education uh, in, in these languages, were speaking them fluently and they didn't even know it. But the people who were from these countries recognized their languages even in the can you imagine the din of noise, uh, din, D-I-N, I'm talking about D-I, that kind of din of noise, where 120 people are speaking in like 15 different languages all at the same time, and yet the ones on the street somehow picked that out. They picked out their, their own, they just heard their own language. They didn't hear the other uh, foreign languages. Anyway, we must move on if we're going to get through to uh, Acts chapter 2, verse 36 through 41. And it says at 36, Therefore let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made that same Jesus whom ye have crucified, God has made him to be Lord and Christ. Now, when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart, and they said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Then Peter said unto them, Repent, that's what you shall do, and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. For the promise is unto you and to your children and to all that are afar off, Okay, let me direct your attention to the map again. He's, he's talking to them over here in Jerusalem, but he says it, it applies to everybody that's afar off. Far off. For the verse 39 again, for the promise is unto you and to your children. Remember, I said a while ago, you, you start out in your own house and then your neighborhood or your next door neighbor or your however many neighbors. And then to those that are afar off. Verse 40. And with many other words did he testify and exhort saying, save yourselves from this untoward generation. Now, well, that, that's talking about 
is 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 you you, you you need the boldness to save yourself from going where the majority of people are going to go. They're going to go down the broad way through the wide gate that leads to destruction. But you got to have the Spirit of God with you that gives you boldness to save yourself from that. Don't follow along. It says that he, uh, verse 40 again, with many other words. So in this verse, we're getting the indication that he, he, he preached a sermon to them, or he gave them uh, whatever uh, um, that needed to be said. And this is, this is Peter talking, by the way. I, uh, I think he was the spokesman uh, for the 11 at this particular time. And he was answering the question of those who had heard his um, sermon, for lack of a better word, and says, this is what you shall do. You, 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 you should repent, back in verse 38. But then in 40 it says, in many other words did he testify and exhort, saying, save yourselves from this untoward generation. Then they that gladly received his word were baptized, and the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. 3,000 of them. And now let's, uh, the next reading goes in uh, chapter 4, um, verses 9 through 13. Now, let, let me tell you that uh, in these readings, the way we're doing this summary, uh, we, we're skipping a lot of good stuff and stuff that needs explanation, frankly, for you to be able to keep up. In other words, these, uh, these particular readings don't just follow one another. They skip from, from one uh, revival to the next revival uh, and, and, and have different parts to them, if you will. Uh, chapter 4, verse 9 through 13 it says, if, the, if we this day be examined of the good deed done to the impotent man, by what means he is made whole, be it known unto you all and to all the people of Israel that it was by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth whom ye crucified, whom God raised from the dead, even by him doth this man stand here before you whole. This is the stone which was set at naught of you builders, which has become the head of the corner. Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Now, when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were unlearned and ignorant men, they marveled. And they took knowledge of them that they had been with Jesus. Um... The they, towards the end of verse 13, where it says, and they took knowledge. That they, those are the Pharisees, the scribes, the doctors of the law. If you go back to last week's lesson, uh, when um, um, Jesus' family had gone uh, for the Passover to Jerusalem from from uh, Nazareth, they had traveled down here to Jerusalem uh, for the, the Passover. And when they uh, started back home, they traveled a day's journey and started to bed down, and Jesus wasn't there. 
uh, I couldn't find Jesus. So Joseph and Mary, and I don't know if they had any of their friends came, come with them or not. The scripture's silent on that. But they came back to Jerusalem and they looked for him for three days before they found him in, in, the, in the temple. And it, it's, the scripture says that he was sitting with the doctors of the law asking and answering questions. Twelve years old. And he, he was doing that sort of thing. Well, that's, that's what this is, is talking about in verse 13. Now, now, when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were unlearned and ignorant men, they marveled and, then, and they took knowledge of them that they had been with Jesus. Well, the reason they knew is because they had been with Jesus not, not long. Well, it had been, it'd been a number of years. It had been, what, what would it be, 30, 20, 20. He was 12 years old. He left here when he was 33. So and, and 21 years or so. But they could, there is some of them remembered back and knew about Jesus, knew about the things, the experiences that they'd had with them. That concludes that reading. So let's go to chapter 7, verse 54. And we're going to read all of the uh, rest of chapter 7. And then the first eight verses of chapter 8. So here we are at 7, uh, 54. It says, When they heard these things, they were cut to the heart, and they gnashed on him with their teeth. Now, it's talking about uh, when they heard these things, it's, it's the same things that Stephen said unto them. See, we're, we're changing... We're moving from one revival to the next revival, okay? Verse 54 again. When they heard these things that Stephen said, they were cut to the heart and they gnashed on him with their teeth. But he, being full of the Holy Ghost, he looked up steadfastly into heaven. Now, let me stop there for a minute because he, he being full of the Holy Ghost, I'm telling you that that's the power that the Holy Ghost brought to him to be able to talk back, so to speak, to the authorities that were there that had rule over him. And yet he could talk back to them because he was full of the Holy Ghost and he looked, looked up steadfastly into heaven and he saw the glory of God. And he saw Jesus standing on the right hand of God. And he said, Ooh, looky here. I see the heavens opened and the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God. Well, nobody else could see that. They thought he was had gone bonkers or whatever. So then they cried out with a loud voice. The they, again, is the, uh, is the whole group of Pharisees and scribes and, and doctors of the law. They cried out with a loud voice and they stopped their ears and they ran upon him with one accord and they cast him out of the city and they stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their clothes at a young man's feet whose name was Saul. And they stoned Stephen, calling upon God. Now, it wasn't they that were calling upon God. It was Stephen calling upon God. And here's what he was saying. Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And he kneeled down. And he cried with a loud voice, Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. And when he had said this, he just went to sleep. Chapter 8. And Saul was consenting unto Stephen's death. 
And at that time, there was a great persecution against the church, which was at Jerusalem. And so they all scattered. They scattered abroad throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria. Well, except for the apostles, the apparently the 11 apostles, only by this time there was 12. They, 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 the 11 had, um, had come together at the direction of God and, and had cast lots uh, for a replacement for Judas who had betrayed Jesus and gone and hanged himself. So the 12 apostles apparently stayed in Jerusalem, but the rest of the believers uh, sc scattered uh, throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria. Now, uh, Samaria, I've, talk I've talked about in recent times uh, that basically the Samaritans were half-breeds it's because the Assyrians, when they came down and captured the uh, ten northern tribes of Israel, they, they took a bunch of the uh, people away from Israel, but they, uh, they caused other people from other parts of the, the world, if you will, the Assyrian world at least, uh, to move in there and they uh, intermarried. And, and then the, the Jews wouldn't have anything to do with those people. The, the Samaritans were uh, not purebreds, if you will. But the church scattered into, and, and right at the end of, ver, of, of verse one, they scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria. So uh, church people uh, went into the place where all these half-breeds lived. Verse 2 says, And devout men carried Stephen to his burial, and they made great lamentation over him. Now as for Saul... He made havoc of the church, entering into every house and hailing men and women. He committed them to prison. Now, he didn't have the power to commit them to prison, but he took them to authorities that did have the power to do so. Okay? Therefore, verse 4, they that were scattered abroad went everywhere preaching the word. Now, I, it's my opinion, my understanding, that when it says they went everywhere preaching the word, they just, they just were talking about Jesus. Everywhere they went, um, use the example I used earlier on the elevator, uh, to the neighbors next door, uh, just ever uh, on the on the job, uh, and and I'm not saying you use your employer's time to try to uh, explain salvation to a coworker. Uh, don't don't steal time from your employer to do that. But in 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 your break time or whatever that sort of thing, you can have these kinds of conversations with the people, and that's what. To me, the way it comes through, that's what they were doing as far as preaching uh, the word at the end of verse 4 uh, in chapter 8, because everybody was not a preacher, and everybody is not a preacher now. Now, now it seems to me, and I've said this before, I've been guilty of saying it before, it seems to me that preachers in general think that everybody ought to be a preacher. And uh, it's, it's, that, that's not, it's not scriptural. You're preaching to the choir. Yeah, the preacher, yeah, so, yeah there's got to be some people in the choir. <laughs> so then Philip, Philip, we're, we're changing, we're moving from one uh, revival to the next. Verse 5, 
Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ unto them. Now, Philip probably was preaching. He probably was uh, employed, if you will, that way, as an evangelist or, or missionary or whatever. It says, And the people with one accord gave heed unto those things which Philip spake, hearing and seeing the miracles which he did. For unclean spirits, crying with a loud voice, came out of many that were possessed with them, and many taken with palsies, and that were lame, were healed. And there was great joy in that city. Now, there's a lot of other things that happened to Philip, but they're not in our reading. We will study them in the next six years and nine months when we uh, finish these uh, introductory summaries that we're going through. Our next reading is chapter 10, starting with verse 9 and going through verse 23. Acts chapter 10, verse 9. On the morrow, as they went on their journey and drew nigh unto the city, Peter went up upon the housetop to pray about the sixth hour. Now, let me tell you, you if you read that fast, it sounds like he's, he's praying about an hour. Uh, he's praying about the sixth hour. He's, that's what he's praying about. Now, that's not what he's praying about. Is that's the time which he went up on the housetop to pray. Verse ten. Now the six. By the way, the sixth hour would be noon, twelve o'clock noon. Okay. In our the way we keep time. Verse ten. And he became very hungry, and he would have eaten. But while they made ready in the house below him, he's up on the housetop, he fell into a trance. And he saw heaven opened in this trance, and a certain vessel descending unto him, as it had been a great sheet knit at the four corners. Do you get that picture? We're talking about a, a, a linen uh, or cotton cloth, uh, roughly the size of a, of a sheet, only maybe probably bigger. And all four corners were up here at the top, and that formed a little pouch. Okay? Verse 12. Wherein, in that pouch, were all manner of four-footed beasts of the earth and wild beasts and creeping things and fowls of the air. And there came a voice to him and said, Get up, Peter, kill and eat. But Peter said, Oh, not so, Lord, for I have never eaten anything that is common or unclean. And the voice spake unto him again the second time. Peter, what God hath cleansed, don't, 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 don't call that common. That call not thou common, whatever God has cleansed. Verse 16 says, this was done three times. And the vessel was received up again into heaven. So now he's kind of coming out of his trance. That vessel has gone back up into heaven. And it's while Peter in the 17th verse doubted in himself what this vision which he had seen should mean. Behold, the men which were sent from Cornelius had made inquiry for Simon's house. And they, they stood outside before the gate or in front of the gate. Now, see, again, we skip here to the next revival, okay? Because this is the first time Cornelius is mentioned. But in, in uh, the uh, preceding verses up until this time, it 
gives us a description of who Cornelius is and, and what kind of a man that he is. And that he sent people to, uh, to get Peter because God told Cornelius to send people to get Peter. Verse 18. Those that were standing before the gate called and asked whether Simon, which was surnamed Peter, was, was lodged there. Now, while Peter thought on the vision, he was thinking about that knit sheet that had been laid, let down three times, the conversation that he had had, what God had said to him about don't call anything that I've cleansed common. While Peter, verse 19, while Peter thought on the vision, the Spirit said unto him, Look here, son. Three men seek thee. Arise, therefore, and get thee down and go with them. And don't doubt, for I have sent them. Then Peter went down to the men which were sent unto him from Cornelius, and they said, Behold, look here, I am he whom ye seek. What is the cause wherefore ye are come? And they said, Cornelius the centurion, a just man, and one that feareth God, and of good report among all the nation of the Jews, was warned from God by an holy angel to send for thee into his house and to hear words of thee. Then called Peter, or then Peter called them in and lodged them, let them spend the night. And on the morrow, Peter went away with them. And certain brethren from Joppa accompanied him. So there was the, the fellows that come from Cornelius plus Peter plus a few of Peter's friends made this trip back to Cornelius' house. And then we skip to verse 34 and go through 44. Verse 34, chapter 10, verse 34. Then Peter opened his mouth and said, Of a truth I perceive that God is no respecter of persons, but in every nation he that reverences God feareth him, I'll say, and worketh righteousness is accepted with God. The word which God sent unto the children of Israel, preaching peace by Jesus Christ, he is the Lord of all. That word, I say, ye know, which was published throughout all Judea and began from Galilee, by all these ignorant Galileans who didn't know how to say these other languages, at the end of verse 37, I'll pick up where I left off. After the baptism was John preached. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power. Now, that, that, there's, there's some significance to that verse. Is that God anointed Jesus of Nazareth. In, a, in, I guess it was last week's lesson, uh, when I, yeah, it was last week's lesson, when I was commenting about uh, Jesus didn't have everything, wisdom, when he was born, when he was a toddler, when he was toddling around, so forth. Uh, but by the time he got to 12, people were astounded at his understanding and at his wisdom. But it said after that, 
even after they were astounded at his wisdom, it said he continued to grow in wisdom. So uh, it was added to him as he got older. Verse 37 again. That word, I say, ye know. It was published throughout all Judea, and it began from Galilee after the baptism which John preached. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power. It doesn't ever say Jesus spoke in any kind of other tongues. He went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil. For God was with him. And we are witnesses of all things which he did, both in the land of the Jews and in Jerusalem, whom they slew and hanged on a tree. Him God raised up the third day and showed him openly, not to all the people, but unto witnesses chosen before God. And we're included in that, even to us, it says, who did eat and drink with him after he rose from the dead. Now, again, there's a verse there with a lot of stuff in it that, that Let me kind of ask it this way. Do you all know how, how blessed you are to have been among the chosen, to have <coughs> received this? Not to all people, but just some witnesses that he chose. And, and I'm telling you, and I, tell, I don't remember it was last week or one of them, everybody that comes to church is not a Christian. Some of them are ambassadors of the enemy. And they are in hiding, but disguised as a Christian. And yet you have to have, uh, when, you, when you see something that's not right going on in, uh, in a church, you have to have the power and the wisdom to be able to refrain from that. Don't join in with that. Don't get involved in that. Don't. Uh, I could spend a long time talking about that. Verse 42, And he commanded us to preach unto the people and to testify that it is he which was ordained of God to be the judge of quick and dead. To him give all the prophets witness that through his name whosoever believeth in him shall receive remission of sins. Uh, yeah, wow. Wow. Just believe in him. And he, he took my sin. And he took the punishment for it. And I don't have to be punished for it. To the contrary, I get the, uh, the, the good stuff. I get the blessings. And he took that for me. Verse 44, we'll conclude this section. While Peter yet spake these words, the Holy Ghost fell on all them which heard the word. And now let's turn to verse 16. I'm sorry, chapter 16. Eh, look at there. See, I made another misstatement and I caught it. Chapter 16, starting with verse 6 and going through uh, uh, verse 15. So here we are at chapter 16, verse 6. Um, now, when they had gone throughout Phrygia, and the region of Galatia, and were forbidden of the Holy Ghost to preach the word in Asia. After they were come to Mysia, they essayed to go into Bithynia. 
but the spirit suffered them not, or the spirit didn't allow them to go, did it? Uh, for some reason, uh, now what we're talking about here is Paul. Paul is going on one of his 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 journeys, and he's up in this general area. Um, Mysia was mentioned there, um, uh, but God didn't allow him to preach uh, in in this area. He sent him on further. It says, so they passed by, verse 8, they passed by Mysia and came down to Troas. And a vision appeared to Paul in the night. And there stood a man of Macedonia in that vision. And they prayed him, saying, Paul, come over unto Macedonia and help us. And after he had seen the vision, Immediately we endeavored to go into Macedonia, assuredly gathering that the Lord had called us for to preach the gospel unto them. Therefore, loosing from Troas, we came with a straight course to Samothracia. Uh, I didn't even know I could say that. Samothracia. And the next day to Neapolis. And from thence to Philippi, which is the chief city of that part of Macedonia. And it's a colony. And we were in that city abiding certain days. And on the Sabbath, we went out of the city by a riverside where prayer was wont to be made. Now, the indication there is that that's where, that's where people went. To get away from the crowds, they went down to the riverside to pray. And we sat down and we spake unto the women which resorted thither. Now, there's an indication that women were the ones who went down by the riverside to pray. Now, yeah, knowing the customs of the times back then, women were not. They didn't have any rights, okay? Uh, but, the, but they had the ability to get away from their men long enough to go down to the river and pray. And the men were going about whatever men did uh, at, at, that, at that time. Verse 14, there was a certain woman there named Lydia. She goes to church here too. Uh, a seller of purple of the city of Thyatira, which worshipped God. And she heard us, she heard us preaching the word. Her heart the Lord opened, that she attended unto the things which were spoken of Paul, or spoken by Paul. And when she was baptized, and her household, she besought us, saying, If ye have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, please come into my house and abide there. And she constrained us. And I'll bet you she took care of them, too. Our next reading is in chapter 18, the first 11 verses. After these things, Paul departed from Athens, and he came to Corinth. And he found a certain Jew named Aquila, born in Pontus, lately come from Italy with his wife Priscilla, because that Claudius had commanded all Jews to depart from Rome. So Paul found this Jew named Aquila and his wife Priscilla, in the last phrase in the verses, and he came unto them, and because he was of the same craft, he abode with them and wrought, for by their occupation they were tent makers. Now, uh, let me tell you my understanding from, from re other readings I have is that uh, this is not a tent like you would picture a tent 
to be. People didn't live in tents even at this time. They lived in houses. They, um, in the Old Testament, people lived in tents. But by now, they had gotten to where they lived in houses. Uh, the tents that Paul and Priscilla and Aquila made were pieces of uh, material that they wore around their neck and let hang down this way. But when it came time to pray, they took that thing over their head and knelt down or stooped down. And there was just a, it just looked like a, a clump there in the road or the sidewalk or whatever. It was somebody under that tent praying. That's the kind of tents that these people were making. Uh, there, there's no way they could have sustained their uh, their being by making uh, the kinds of tents that people camp out in or live back in those days lived in. So this is the kind of thing, and every every new convert had to have a tent, had to have one of these things that you know as they. Uh, Anyway, I'm spending too much time explaining stuff and I'm not reasoning, I mean, not reading enough. Uh, verse 4, and he reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath and he persuaded the Jews and the Greeks. But when Silas and Timotheus were come from Macedonia, Paul was pressed in the spirit and testified to the Jews that Jesus was Christ. And when they opposed themselves and blasphemed, he shook his raiment and said unto them, Your blood be upon your own heads. I'm clean. From henceforth I will go unto the Gentiles. Okay, so what's happening here is that, uh, that, that uh, initially Paul, when he left uh, Jerusalem and went on his missionary journey, he was going to his kinsfolks, the Jews, and went into the synagogues and talked to them uh, and, and persuaded them. And the ones that, that believed, believed. And the ones that didn't believe, didn't believe. Uh, but in this particular case, uh, when, when, when he came to Corinth, uh, it indicates in verse 6 that the people of the uh, of the synagogue said, you're blaspheming. You're, you know, he, they, basically they were cursing him. And, and Paul says, okay, I'm through talking to you. Your blood is going to be upon your own heads. I'm reading in the middle of verse 6. He says, I'm, I'm clean. I've delivered myself. And from now on, henceforth, I will go unto the Gentiles. I'll talk to somebody else instead of talking to my kinfolks. So he departed thence, and he entered into a certain man's house named Justice, one that worshipped God, whose house was joined hard to the synagogue. That just mean that, means that it had a common wall with the synagogue. Uh, it, it was right up against it. And Crispus, the chief ruler of the synagogue, he believed on the Lord with all his house. And many of the Corinthians hearing believed and were baptized. Then spake the Lord to Paul in the night by a vision. Be not afraid, Paul, but speak and hold out thy peace, for I am with thee. And no man shall set on thee to hurt thee, for I have much people in this city. And he continued there a year and six months, teaching the word of God among them. And now we go to chapter 19, uh, verses 1 through 10. And it came to pass that while Apollos was at Corinth, 
Paul, having passed through the upper coast, came to Ephesus. And finding certain disciples, he said unto them, Have you received the Holy Ghost since ye believed? And they said unto him, Why, we've not so much as heard whether there be any Holy Ghost. And he said unto them, Unto what then were ye baptized? And they said, Unto John's baptism. And they then said, Paul, well, John verily baptized with the baptism of repentance, saying unto the people that they should believe on him which should come after him, that is, on Christ Jesus. When they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And then Paul, he laid his hands upon them, and the Holy Ghost came on them, and they spake with tongues and prophesied. And all the men were about twelve. And he went into the synagogue, and he spake boldly for the space of three months, disputing and persuading the things concerning the kingdom of God. So let me stop there and say, uh, he went into the synagogue, even after a little while ago we read that he, he gave up on the Jews and says, I'm just going to go speak to the Gentiles. Well, when he went to the synagogue, uh, uh, the the people who came into the synagogue were uh, mostly Jews, but maybe some Gentiles who believed. <laughs> Verse 9, uh, But when diverse were hardened and believed not, but spake evil of that way before the multitude, he departed from them, and he separated the disciples, disputing daily in the school of one Tyrannus. Now, Essentially, that verse is saying the same thing happened as what happened before. Uh, and so he left the synagogue because they, they didn't want him there anymore. Verse 10, and this continued, te teaching in the school of Tyrannus, this continued, verse 10, by the space of two years, so that all they which dwelt in Asia heard the word of the Lord Jesus both Jews and Greeks. We just have a few more verses. Turn to chapter 28, which is the last chapter in the book of Acts. Chapter 28, verse 16, all by itself. It says, And when we came to Rome, the centurion delivered the prisoners to the captain of the guard. But Paul was allowed or suffered to dwell by himself with a soldier that kept him. Now, we, we're going to read later that he dwelt by himself in a hired house or a rented house house, if you will. Uh, chapter 20, I'm sorry, same chapter, verse 23 and 24. It says, And when they had appointed him a day, there came many to him into his lodging. That's talking about Paul. There came many into Paul's lodging, to whom Paul expounded and testified the kingdom of God. Now, the kingdom of God, he's telling, them, he's telling them, and look, it's this high off the ground. It goes everywhere. It's already been established. Jesus came here, and he's the king of it. And, and it's not uh, some physical kingdom or country that's, that, that's d defined by uh, borders of some sort. Um, anyway, let's go back to... Uh, middle of verse 23, see, he was persuading them concerning Jesus, both out of the law of Moses and out of the prophets, from morning till evening. And what that verse is telling us is that he was preaching out of the Old Testament. We have a lot of people from time to time in different, 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 different approaches, that, but... 
And they'll say, the Old Testament's gone, you know, we don't have anything to do with the Old Testament, we don't have anything to do with don't, well, it's just the New Testament. But Paul preached out of the Old Testament. He preached the gospel out of the Old he Testament. He didn't have New Testament to preach <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> yeah, he, yeah he, had to, he had to write his own New Testament. That's yeah. basically what happens there. <laughs> Verse 24. And some believed the things which were spoken, and some believed not. Uh, you know, there's some things just never change, because it's still that way today. Most believe not. A few. Do you realize how blessed you are if you believe, if you've been persuaded, if the Spirit has come and lived within you and has caused you to understand who Jesus is? How blessed we are. This little, little bit. Now we're scattered all over in in this big world, but 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 we're still we're going spiritually this high off the ground. We're we're going down the the narrow way to the straight gate that leads to life everlasting. Uh, four more verses, starting with verse twenty eight and going to the end of the chapter. Verse 28, Be it known therefore unto you that the salvation of God is sent unto the Gentiles and that they will hear it. Boy, am I glad. I, I'm, I'm, I'm a Gentile. Verse 29, And when he had said these words, the Jews departed and had great reasoning among themselves. And Paul dwelt two whole years in his own Ranted house, hired house, and he received all that came in unto him, preaching the kingdom of God and teaching those things which concern the Lord Jesus Christ with all confidence, and nobody kept him from it. No man forbidding him. He was in Rome. Supposedly in prison, but he was living in a rented house. He was granted privileges that uh, perhaps wouldn't have been normal. Uh, you know, I don't know. Any questions or thoughts? Uh, uh, Just real quickly, uh, if anybody's interested any more in praying in the Spirit, it talks about it in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 14. Okay. Chapter what? Chapter 14, verse 14. Chapter 14, verse 14. First Start Corinthians. Around there and they talk about it a little bit. All right. Well, we'll get there sometime in the next uh, six years and nine months. <laughs> All right. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you today for your goodness to us, your mercy to us, your blessings on us that you have chosen us to be among the few, to hear your word, not just to hear it, but to believe it. Not just believe it, but to not reject it. Thank you, Lord, for helping us to believe and help our unbelief, Lord. Help us, help our doubts. Bless us. We pray in the name of Jesus of Nazareth, who indeed is our soul Savior. Amen.